two sightings from the state of Idaho. The first one lasts for 20 minutes. The second one is within eight feet. Hear all about it plus more coming up next. Welcome to Will Star Monsters and Mysteries. Today I have two very interesting sightings from the great state of Idaho. The first one is campers out on a hike. They have a sighting of two Sasquatch creatures, an adult and a juvenile, that last for more than 20 minutes. Afterwards, they go to the location and check out where the creatures were. We're going to hear all about that. The second sighting has to do with a man and his family. He actually has a few sightings, but one of them he gets to within 8 feet of the creature. And he says the creature has a physical deformity. Now he thinks it's one thing, but I think it could be something else. From the way he describes the creature, I think it could have something to do with crossbreeding with abducted humans. That's just a theory. I can't prove that though. And I want you to leave me some comments and let me know what you think it might be after you hear the story. Alright, enough about that. If you're new to the channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. What are you waiting for? And everybody, after you watch the video, and if you like it, make sure you hit that like button. We all know how YouTube is a fiend for the like button. All joking aside though, it really does help with the algorithm. All right, enough about that. Let's go ahead and get into this. Lataw County, Idaho, July 2005. This 20-minute sighting took place on the densely forested Moscow Mountain in northern Idaho's Lataw County. With its summit reaching almost 5,000 feet, this mountain area is part of the Palouse Range of Mountains and is adjacent to the rugged St. Joe's National Forest. Numerous water sources on the mountain and lush vegetation provide rich habitat for a variety of species of wildlife. Over 240 different wild species live in the Palouse Range watershed, including elk, moose, mink, bobcat, and cougar, with the greatest diversity found in birds. Several varieties of fish also inhabit the streams. Although located close to a university town of Moscow, Idaho, the mountain area has a remote feel to it. The sparse human presence on the mountain, the narrow winding and rough roads, and the 1,000-year-old ancient cedar grove covering 269 acres lend Moscow Mountain an air of wild seclusion. Two people, a man and a woman, visiting from a neighboring state observed the figures on Moscow Mountain. The male observer in his 40s is a pilot with 2010 vision, experienced as a backcountry bow hunter, and in fact, as a young man at a hunting camp somewhere in Utah, was told by one of the elders that the weird howls in the middle of the night were in fact Sasquatch. However, he was very surprised and intrigued by this long visual encounter that they had. His partner that clear sunny day was a female, also in her 40s, a city girl with little naturalist experience. The male witness will be called J and the female witness called C. The witness J and his female companion C had been camping on Moscow Mountain for several days with some friends in late July, early August 2005. The last day, J and C decided to take a 4-5 to five hour hike after everyone else in the party had departed. The hike was uneventful until the pair stopped high on the mountain to rest on a rock outcropping. This lookout afforded them vistas of the surrounding terrain. They were just above the remains of an old abandoned ski resort, as well as an old clear-cut logging area. The two were standing just below the peak on a rock outcropping. As Jay gazed out at the view to the south-southeast, C stood slightly below. C was facing Jay as she talked, while Jay looked beyond her to see the area below. After about 15 minutes of resting in this spot, Jay's attention was drawn to a sort of mechanical movement of an old stump in a clear-cut area below. Noticing his distraction, C interrupted her story to turn and look at the movement Jay had been observing. As they both watched the dark stump, they could see a small movement every 30 seconds or so. This continued for roughly 3 minutes on the lower embankment of an old fire road below. This observed stump was off to the southeast of the couple, approximately 350 yards distant and about 500 foot elevation drop. After about 10 minutes, the dark stump stood up. At this point, they realized they were watching something alive rather than mechanical. It appeared to be a tall, dark figure, perhaps a bear on its hind legs, they thought. At this same time, J and C noticed a small, golden blonde figure running around the large standing one. 
The small figure was frolicking around in a manner that made them wonder if it was a cub or perhaps maybe a dog, except that it moved upright like a small rambunctious child. Puzzling over what they were viewing, JMC saw the large animal step up towards their position onto the road above the embankment on which it had been first sighted. At this point, they could see all of its body and decided that it could not be a bear. The large animal was walking on two legs, was shaped like a large, very heavy human covered with dark fur. They could clearly see a head set almost directly upon wide shoulders, so that the shoulders and head formed a triangular shape. Its two arms were clearly not front legs and swung as it walked. They were longer than a human's, hanging almost to its knees. The witnesses could not figure out what they were saying. The large figure then walked about 30 yards away from their position off below the road. It stopped and then came back up about 10 yards and started walking sideways still below the road. It would stop, walk, bend over, and then continue. It appeared to be meandering back to the road while inspecting the ground for something. The plants and grass in this area came up to its waist. As the large figure was thus employed, the small blonde figure was bouncing around near its legs with only its head and shoulders visible. Although not always as easily visible, the small figure appeared to be shaped like the big one and moved about like the big one only faster. When the tall dark figure, having made a sort of semicircle below the road, reached the fire road again, it stood erect and upright for a moment, facing the witness's direction. It stood completely still and appeared to be listening or watching for any movement. J and C remained absolutely still and silent in the shadows of their resting spots. The wind was gently blowing towards J and C from the direction of the figures. The little blonde one then ran up to the big one upon the road and both were in plain sight standing on the fire road. It was then very clear that it was a smaller different colored version of the larger one. As the witnesses tried to make sense of what they were seeing, they both thought out loud that it was weird to see a human dressed in a fursuit on the mountain, with his child similarly dressed. Even as this thought and words emerged, the absurdity was obvious. The temperature was near 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and they had not heard or seen any signs of other humans on their remote hike. After a brief pause, the large figure strided up to the side of a 15 to 20 foot steep incline cut on the uphill side of the fire road. It then used smooth, massive strides to cover the steep vertical distance easily and quickly without ever needing to use its arms for balance. The little one stayed on the road while the big one meandered in and out of the tree line immediately above. After a few minutes, the big one easily stepped down from above back to the fire road. Then with the little one in tow, the large figure began walking up the road in the direction of J and C. These figures were in a complete, unobstructed, clear view, walking erect almost directly at the observers. This is when J and C both gasp in amazement, with J saying out loud, Oh my god, it's a Sasquatch! C answered out loud, What is that? J answered, A Bigfoot! These figures were now at about a 10 degree angle off to the side below where the witnesses stood. After passing behind a clump of trees blocking them from view for a few seconds, the figures came into clear view again moving closer. As they kept walking, they went behind the next clump of trees along the road and then were not seen again. JNC waited and watched another 15 to 20 minutes to see if the figures might appear again and they wondered where they might have gone. With no sight of them, the witnesses feeling uneasy finally decided to continue their hike. They spent about an hour hiking down into and around the ancient cedar forest on Moscow Mountain. They eventually felt uncomfortable in this environment and decided to leave. After arriving back at their vehicle where they had camped, they discussed whether to drive to the fire road where they had sighted the animals. Jay figured he could get to the road. So at about 4.30 p.m., they drove to the rock outcropping where they first sighted the two figures. They were then able to drive to the fire road below. The sun was going down behind the mountaintop at this point and they were partially in and out of shadows by the time they reached the fire road. Jay was very nervous. It took several minutes to brief C on how to use the Ruger 45 caliber handgun he now had strapped on his belt. J and C easily walked to the spot where the large figure had sat. They found disturbed areas of grass and dirt below. C stayed on the road where the adult first stood while J walked off the road below through the weeds that were shoulder to head high on him. J is 5 foot 10 inches tall, so the weeds were between 5 and 5 foot 10 inches tall. Given that the large animal's waist was visible above the weeds, its height must have been in the 8.5 foot to 9 foot range. J could follow the large figure strides by the impressions in the grass and they range from 6 to 8 feet long. 
Nearby, the couple also noticed some burned out logs that had been rolled as if to search for something underneath. The couple then found the steep cut embankment up the hillside on the uphill side of the fire road showing disturbed ground as signs that something large had passed up through. The large figure had walked approximately 10 feet straight up this incline without breaking stride as it moved up from the fire road to the forested area above. J&C climbed with difficulty up the cut embankment to look around. This is where they found a large footprint and a small footprint. Some carpenter anthills were in this area next to dead trees. In one of these, Jay found a very large bare footprint, clearly outlined in a small area of soft dirt surrounding the anthill. It was roughly human shaped with five toes. Near this, J and C also found the indentation of a smaller bare footprint less detailed than the large print. The small print was the same length as a men's size 9 or 10 shoe but wider. The large footprint was twice as big or more in both length and width. After a few minutes of searching into the forested area, J and C moved back down to the fire road. J and C then walked down the road about 90 yards to where the second clump of trees began, which is where the figures were last seen. In doing so, they were surprised to find what a great distance the two observed figures had covered in such a short amount of time. These two figures had obviously been moving more quickly than J and C could, but from above they appeared to be strolling casually. Below this area where the figures were last spotted was a ravine filled with very thick, tall vegetation. It was now around 6.30 p.m. and J and C were expected back in Moscow for dinner with friends, so they decided not to go down into the ravine for further investigation. Arriving late for dinner, J and C were both still shocked at the day's events. Their dinner companions noticed their behavior, and after much coaxing got them to share their unusual story. The Moscow friends, upon hearing the details of the sighting, said they must have seen two yetis. Neither J nor C previously had any interest in Bigfoot or otherwise. The couple's impression of the two figures led them to the conclusion that the pair was likely apparent and juvenile. For approximately 10 minutes, the little one would run up to the adult who would tickle or wrestle with it briefly. Then the little one would run off and frolic again. For some moments, the little one would appear to suckle or nurse while sitting on the big one's lap. It was hard to tell as the big one's back was to the observers. Hence, the tree stump appearance. Due to the distance, J and C could not see any clear visible indications of gender for either figure. Alright, for this one I have the quick encounter report and then I also have the investigative report afterward that fills in some more details. Bonner County, Idaho, 1975. In 1975, north of Switzer Ski Area, six of us saw a young one about the size of a 10-year-old boy. He looked like a 10-year-old boy with hair all over it. He walked across the logging road about 40 yards ahead of us. He turned and looked right at us. While he was crossing, there in the bushy draw, you could hear something that sounded like a holler monkey. It appeared to be his mother. Later that fall, about two miles south of there, the one that I took to be his mother hung around for a couple years. She was maybe less than 5 foot tall though, and heavy built with short legs. She was yellow, about the color of a yellow cocker spaniel. She had long, beautiful, wavy hair, and the hair on her head was long enough that you could not see her ears. She would come up and eat corn cob with molasses on it out of the horse pen. In 1975, we had built a little plywood shack, and we did not have enough plywood to fill in one side. It had rained until the Forest Service had put up a cable across the road. We could not get in there for a couple days. When we got up there, the big one had taken the boards off one side of the shack and threw them in a pile. She went in and picked up a 100-pound sack of horse feed and carried it out to the other side of the house and set it out on a road bank and tore a hole in the center of the sack, sat down beside it, and ate out of it. Later that fall, my son and daughter and I were waiting for a man to pick up a load of cedar waste. I had taken a Dutch oven full of enchiladas and we heated them up over the coals. When the dog started running back and forth and looking up the hill, I told my kids that I thought there was a bear or cougar up there. We'd go see. We went maybe 100 yards down the road and started up the hill towards the old lookout tower. The stumps were 8 to 10 feet tall in the area and our Sasquatch was real good at keeping a stump between us so we could not get a real good look at her. At that time, I was in really good shape and I could outrun her going up the hill. My daughter was old enough that she could outrun her too. The Sasquatch came to a place where the stumps were pretty far apart and she put her hand up on a stump and turned around and looked at us. Then she kept on going up the hill until she came to the next road where a logger had felled the logs on the side of the road. They were about 12 to 18 inches at the base and laid out across the little hill and they still had the limbs on them. 
She turned around again, and then she started crawling back under the logs. The dog and I were about 8 feet from her. She was hissing like a cat and swatting at the dog with her hands. She had hands with nails on them, just like a person's hands. I heard my daughter screaming, and she was running down the hill just as fast as she could go. I am not a coward, but I did not have the guts to crawl under the logs to get a better look at her. I never got but one more good look at her. A year later, the hound hunter was running bears with his hounds, and he treed this yellow Sasquatch. I knew him and his hounds really well, and I was about 300 yards across from the canyon from him, but he didn't know I was there. He grabbed his hounds and loaded them up and left. He never came back in there with his hounds. I ran into him in Sandpoint and asked him what he treed with his hounds that day, and he denied even being there. Alright, the follow-up investigative report goes like this. This is an amazing set of sightings. They occurred in the vicinity of Caribou Lake, which is about 12 miles northwest of Sandpoint, Idaho. DB the witness is now 74 years old and still living in northern Idaho. DB reported the stories about the yellow Sasquatch and the young one just as they were written in his report. It's hard to convey the quality of truthfulness and sincerity evident in his descriptions. All I can say is that I have no doubt that DB was being honest with me. And his sightings, especially the one in which he got to within 8 feet of the animal, then saw its fingernails and a thumb and looked into its eyes, make misidentification extremely unlikely. It didn't have claws. It had fingernails like us, he told me. DB described the female as short, fairly squat, but strong looking, and he thought its legs were somewhat bowed. Maybe it had some kind of dwarfism, he said. When I asked DB about the bear hunter and his hounds training the female, he said he saw the incident fairly well and was certain about it. She stood out because of her color on the branch of the tree, he said. DB's son, MB, who is now 37 years old, lives in Arkansas and is a long-haul trucker. He remembered the sightings, seeing the hairy kid cross the trail, and the blonde one. My dad and sister saw the blonde one a lot better than me though, he said. MB also mentioned that he saw a chestnut colored Sasquatch that no one else saw. I used to take off into the woods, it was just walking by. As a kid it seemed 20 feet tall, but it was probably more like 7 to 8 feet, he said. He said at first he thought it was a bear, but it was walking on two legs, it was covered in long hair, and it stunk really bad. MB also told me that back then he saw Sasquatch tracks on a few occasions, in mud by the creek and in snow. They were super sized, he said. He could fit both of his feet into one of the tracks. Like his father, MB impressed me as completely truthful. Neither man had any particular interest in whether or not the sighting was published. When I asked MB if he thought Bigfoot was real, he replied, Let me tell you something, they're there. DB's response to the same question was, Oh, they're there. You can count on that. It's just that they're so good at hiding, but when you see one, you know.